Well, thank you so much for that um, really kind introduction. Um, thanks all of you for uh, coming. It's really great to be giving the energy seminar. Um, I guess before I dive into the talk, I do want to make sure I acknowledge all of the uh, graduate students and postdocs and collaborators who made this work possible. There are a number of people on this list. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't bring a laser pointer. Um, does anyone happen to have one? If not, I'll just point. Um, but I especially want to um, give a shout out to Eileen Coe, the staff scientist here at Stanford in charge of the transmission electron microscopes, um, and also Bob Sinclair. Oh, oh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Ah, perfect. Um, so as you guys heard, uh, Energy Seminar Take One um, was supposed to be the first day of last quarter. I'm sorry I couldn't make it then, but um, we, uh, or I guess I had the chance to witness a different form of energy that day, um, the birth of our second son, um, Hugo, and this is our first son, uh, Marcus, meeting Hugo for the first time. He was pretty excited to become a big brother. Um, and uh, I mean, I wish I was here to chat with you, but I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share with you my work a quarter later. And I think in giving birth and having a family, it kind of puts um, the energy problem in perspective. And what I'd like to open up my talk with is um, a quote from one of my favorite authors, Jack Kerouac, which says, the only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. The ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, burn, burn like fabulous yellow Roman candles, exploding like spiders across the stars. And I feel like many people at Stanford fit into this category. That's why I love being here so much. And I'd like to pitch the question, just to open up the talk, what makes you mad to live? It may be science, it may be renewable energy, it may be family, it may be mountain biking. Um, pretty much all of those things fall in the category of things that I'm mad to live about. And one particular thing that definitely makes me mad to live um, is the fact that average temperatures will increase by more than 2 degrees Celsius unless 90% of our energy is from carbon-free sources by 2050. And as many of you know, in 2016, renewable sources accounted for only about 17% of world energy consumption. <coughs> so I find this to be a pretty shocking statistic and one that's hopefully a call for action um, for all of us. Thankfully, I think if we look to the field of nanophotonics, there's been a lot of hope. And if you look at all of the speakers that um, this series has hosted in the past few years, they've presented a really, I think, optimistic or um, kind of hopeful picture for the future that I would agree with. So <clears throat> just talking a little bit about what nanophotonics can do to help address the energy challenge, there's been a lot of really beautiful work, um, including by some speakers who have spoken at this seminar in the past, for example, Eli Yablonovich on light management for photovoltaics, where people are designing new materials and new methods to precisely control how photovoltaic materials absorb the solar spectrum, giving rise to structures that have near unity absorption across a fairly large bandwidth and can efficiently convert photovoltaic material or uh, convert sunlight um, into electricity with high efficiency. Um, I'll just point out Harry Atwater has some of the most efficient um, solar cells demonstrated to date with his um, company, Alta, and he's used a lot of these um, tricks and techniques. Kind of a second area where nanophotonics has helped um, in uh, enabling renewable energy uh, generation and storage is in um, enabling more efficient uh, storage of electricity in fuels. So for example, people have used nanostructured materials, for example, um, nanostructured uh, gold to enable efficient uh, water splitting. And then a final area um, that I think has been discussed in this seminar series in years past um, is using new nanomaterials, in particular plasmonic materials, um, for water purification and also pollutant removal. Um, so a particular area of interest is, for example, in using um, excited carriers in metals, hot carriers in metals that can be injected into a semiconductor to enable um, new and efficient redox reactions in, for example, water purification. So there's a broad spectrum of areas in which nanophotonics has helped um, address this challenge. And the two areas I want to talk about um, in part draw on these examples, but also provide kind of a new perspective to how plasmons can help. So first, I want to talk about um, efficient renewable energy storage. Um, I think storage is an important part of um, the renewable energy challenge. First, of course, is generation. 
And what I'll present in this part of my talk is a new in situ microscopy technique based on um, electron microscopy and plasma spectroscopy to understand how chemical energy storage depends upon nanomaterial and nanoparticle size and shape and crystallinity. And then in the second part of my talk, I want to talk about efficient solar energy conversion for either photovoltaics or for solar fuels. Um, and I'll present a new upconversion scheme that can take lower energy photons um, nominally from the solar um, spectrum and convert them to higher energy photons to enable more efficient solar fuel um, or photovoltaic conversion efficiencies. And this upconversion scheme is based on hot carriers um, that take subband gap light and then convert it to above band gap light. Okay, so let's start with the um, energy storage part of the picture. So probably all of us has one of these or one of its cousins basically in our pocket. And while we um, may complain that the battery life doesn't quite last long enough, um, it's pretty remarkable that um, in 2016, the weight of say an iPhone is about 0.3 pounds. It only costs about $200 um, and the battery can last 300 hours on standby. Um, and it only takes about two hours to recharge your phone. And you can get about a thousand charge cycles before you need to replace your battery on the iPhone. If you compare that um, with the phones that were out in 1984, for example, the brick phone um, that Gordon Gecko used in his uh, rendition of Wall Street, um, the phones weighed over two pounds. Um, they cost about $10,000, um, dollars The battery lifetime was only an hour on standby. It took 10 hours to recharge the battery and the battery only lasted for 100 um, charge cycles. So like I said, we may complain about battery life here, but we've come a long way from 1984 to today, um, and a lot of the reduction in weight and cost is due to advances in battery technologies. So if you look at a big picture of how a lot of energy storage devices, including um, batteries and uh, fuel cells work, generally ions are intercalating into a host material, into a, an electrode, allowing that energy to be stored. And if you take a scanning electron micrograph of the interior of a battery, such as uh, the Samsung battery, you'll find that the electrode is composed of a lot of nanoparticles. So um, ions aren't just going into a bulk matrix, um, allowing energy to be stored, but generally they're going into nanoparticles. And that's because it's been found heuristically that these nanoparticles, first of all, have faster kinetics, so you can get the ions into and out of the material faster, allowing your battery to charge up faster. So just going back to this slide, now you can see basically it only takes about two hours to recharge a battery instead of 10 hours. Further, it's been found that they have an extended life cycle. So again, going back to this slide where we have a thousand charge cycles on our iPhone now compared to less than a hundred charge cycles back in 1984. It's been found that if you nanostructure the electrodes, you can charge and discharge your battery many more times before it needs to be replaced. And then finally, it's been found that um, these nanoparticles tend to have size-dependent thermodynamics. So for example, you could charge up your battery at a lower potential, a lower chemical potential, if you nanostructure your electrode. But looking at this picture, you'll notice that there are nanoparticles of a variety of sizes and shapes and crystallinity. And it's not really clear which particles are best. And that's part of what my talk is going to address today. Unfortunately, lithium ion systems are kind of like messy and volatile systems to work with. There are some researchers on campus who are doing some really beautiful work actually looking inside battery electrodes um, to look at uh, how lithium gets into these materials. Um, but what we want to know is not necessarily how lithium is getting in, but really how can we design next generation battery electrodes um, by watching this process in well-engineered nanoparticles and then saying, okay, in this particular shape nanoparticle, here's what happens, or in this particular size nanoparticle, here's what happens. So instead of looking at lithium intercalation into nanoparticles, we're going to look at a much simpler system, but one that has very analogous physics. It turns out the thermodynamics of the system um, are quite similar to the thermodynamics of uh, what is thought to happen in lithium ion systems. So it's a system of um, palladium hydrogenation and it's a very old system. Basically, studies of the system started back in the mid, like, 1800s. It was one of the first um, phase transformations in bulk to be well understood. And in bulk, here's the phase diagram. So I'm plotting the hydrogen gas pressure on the vertical axis 
as a function of the concentration of hydrogen per palladium, so the number of hydrogen atoms per palladium atoms in the crystal lattice. And you'll see that at low hydrogen pressures, um, the system basically exists in the alpha phase. It's a dilute interstitial solid solution. So you have hydrogen gas in the environment. It gets catalytically split at the surface into um, two hydrogen um, atoms or ions that each intercalate into the host matrix and basically sit at those interstitial sites in the crystal lattice. And now let's just fix our temperature, say for example at 120 degrees C. So we're in the alpha phase and then as we ramp up the hydrogen pressure, at one pressure, um, the system can very abruptly uptake quite a bit of hydrogen, um, entering what's known as the beta phase. So the beta phase is sketched here. Um, it's generally where, say at room temperature, 20 degrees C, more than 60% of those interstitial sites are occupied with hydrogen. This beta phase is characterized by a pretty significant volume expansion. So in bulk, the volume expansion is about 3% in lattice constant, so about 10% in volume. Um, so there's a pretty significant um, volume expansion associated with this phase change. And then I'll also mention that kind of in between the two phases, you have this coexistence region in bulk, so coexistence of alpha plus beta. So a handful of years ago, um, people realized, just like they did with the lithium ion batteries, that in the simple hydrogenation-based system, um, when you start nanostructuring materials, you get some pretty interesting physics to emerge, um, namely faster kinetics, the size tunable thermodynamics, and also extended life cycles. And um, here was one really nice study um, that was by Jeff Urban's group at Berkeley, where they did ensemble studies of nanostructured palladium and they were able to see significant deviations from bulk behavior. In this particular study, they saw that when they um, nanostructured the palladium, there was a reduced hydrogen storage. So they couldn't get quite as much hydrogen into the system as they would have liked. Um, and there was a more gradual phase transition. So you'll notice on this slide um, that the phase transition happens rather abruptly. So just kind of working through um, each of these electron micrographs and the associated isotherms, so they're basically fixing the temperature um, and mapping out um, the phase as a function of hydrogen pressure. Here are larger nanoparticles that are 110 nanometers across, and they're overlaid on an isotherm um, for the bulk material, and you'll notice they look quite similar. Um, one of these graphs corresponds to loading, so they're increasing the hydrogen pressure, and then they decrease the hydrogen pressure, and this system shows hysteresis. So these particles tend to unload hydrogen at a lower hydrogen pressure than they would absorb hydrogen. So this looks a lot like bulk. And then as they nanostructured the materials, um, these were all single crystalline nanocubes that had sizes of 32 nanometers. They noticed that these isotherms became more sloped. So you'll notice that for a fixed hydrogen pressure, um, the amount of hydrogen in the system was less than what they had in the larger nanoparticles and in the bulk system, so hence the reduced energy storage capacity or hydrogen storage capacity. Um, and then you'll see the gradual phase transition um, become more pronounced as the nanoparticle size was reduced. So this was an ensemble study, and um, it really intrigued researchers saying, huh, this is kind of unlike what we um, thought we might have for batteries, where in batteries we've seen kind of heuristically or by like check um, and guess that these nanostructured electrodes perform better. Here this seemed to imply that perhaps the nanostructured materials may not perform as well in these hydrogen-based systems. But researchers thought it could have been just an artifact of it being an ensemble measurement. So while these were really well-controlled nanoparticle syntheses, where all of the nanoparticles in the measurement had a well-controlled crystallinity um, and size, it is possible that still you're averaging over the ensemble and individual nanoparticles have slightly different characteristics. So researchers turned to single particle studies and uh, plasmons enabled the first single particle study starting in um, 2011. There was first this really nice study by the Longhammer group at Chalmers University where they put small palladium nanoparticles on top of a gold nano antenna um, and then use optical scattering and spectroscopy to basically detect what the phase of the palladium would be. If you just had the palladium on its own, it turns out a single particle wouldn't quite scatter strongly enough to be able to figure out what the phase would be. But by having this gold nano antenna on top, they could get a pretty significant scattering signal. 
Um, and when there was uh, no hydrogen, they got the scattering signal shown here in blue. When there was hydrogen in the environment, they got the scattering signal shown here in pink. Um, and they were able to look at shifts. You can see basically in the full with half max, there's a slight change in the line shape um, to map out isotherms. So the isotherms in this measurement looked quite a bit more like bulk, regardless of the size nanoparticle they'd put on top of this gold nano antenna. There was a related study by the Oliva Sados group that was published shortly thereafter where they had kind of the planar version of this structure. Again, there's a gold nano antenna. I should mention that these gold nano antennas support surface plasmon resonances that basically allow light to be focused onto the palladium nanoparticle and then allow kind of the phase to be um, transduced as an optical signal into the far field. So in this planar analog, um, they mapped out kind of something like an isotherm, so hydrogen pressure versus wavelength. Here they were looking at shifts not in the full width half max, but in the peak scattering signal. And they saw isotherms that were a little bit more sloped upon cycling. So these are just a couple of studies, but if you look broadly through the literature, there is a lot of ambiguity as to what might be happening in this particular system um, as you nanostructured the materials. And um, right around the time this was happening, I got the chance to go to Sweden, um, where I met with uh, a professor, Igor Zorich, um, and told him we were trying to understand the thermodynamics and kinetics of the palladium hydride system. And then he informed me, ah, if you can resolve this debate, it'd be great, because right now my question to God would be, what are the hydriding thermodynamics of a single palladium nanoparticle? So that's what um, hopefully the first part of my talk will address. So the technique that we decided to rely on is um, in situ um, electron um, microscopy and spectroscopy. And in particular, we're going to rely strongly on a technique called electron energy loss spectroscopy and an environmental scanning transmission electron microscope. So we synthesize, uh, it's kind of a mouthful of words. Um, it's actually a very easy technique to understand. First of all, we synthesize palladium nanoparticles. We disperse them on an electron transparent substrate. And then we come in with an electron beam. You can think about the electron beam as kind of a broadband white light source, but here just focus down and that allows us to get a high spatial resolution. And then the electron beam passes through um, the nanoparticle and we can use the electron beam to image the nanoparticles, but we can also use um, the electron beam to enable spectroscopy. And in particular, when the electron passes through the particle, it loses some of its energy by exciting some of the electronic modes in the nanoparticle. And it turns out that the various modes that get excited at different wavelengths um, are proportional to the permittivity of the material, or essentially the dielectric constant. So the electron energy loss spectra signal is um, proportional to the imaginary component of one over the permittivity. So EELS is a really good signal of kind of the electronic signature, the electronic structure of a material. And that's something that you can imagine gets changed when there's either a new phase or when there's hydrogen intercalating into the palladium. So advantages of using um, this technique um, are, are many, but I'd say one huge advantage is that we have near atomic scale resolution. So in the electron microscope, there's an imaging spatial resolution of 0.07 nanometers, sub angstrom, um, basically imaging spatial resolution. So we can look, um, uh, oh, sorry for the typo here, we can look both at and within single nanoparticles. Also, since we're colloidally synthesizing our nanoparticles, we have control over the sample shape and the crystallinity. So we can synthesize a variety of shapes and sizes and crystallinities and then look exactly at the thermodynamics of a single nanoparticle and figure out which ones might be best to kind of maximize this energy storage capacity. And then finally, unlike many of the other single particle measurements that are out there that rely on nano antennas to kind of transduce the signal to the far field, um, this is a direct measurement of the chemical and electronic properties. We don't need to have any nearby nano antennas that may otherwise influence the thermodynamics or kinetics. I want to show you um, just three different classes of nanoparticles, um, basically a square, a prism, um, and an icosahedron. The square and the prism are single crystalline nanoparticles, so by looking at these two nanoparticles, we can deconvolve the effects of shape. And then this icosahedron is polycrystalline, so we can look at how different crystallinities might in fact the storage capabilities. So we disperse our nanoparticles um, on an electron transparent grid, and then we identify individual nanoparticles that we want to look at more closely. 
And like I said, we can image each of these nanoparticles with very high spatial resolution. And then we switch over to um, something called scanning transmission electron microscopy mode, where we basically focus the electron beam down a little bit, but we use, lose a little bit of imaging resolution there um, in order to be able to get higher um, spectral resolution. So here's one nanoparticle. It's 23 nanometers across. It's palladium. Um, and then we uh, here uh, spread out the beam um, to probe about 5 to 10 nanometers across the center of the nanoparticle. And then um, the electron beam goes through the center of the nanoparticle, and we collect an electron energy loss spectra. So this is basically Eels counts or intensity as a function of energy or wavelength. And when we have um, no hydrogen or very little hydrogen in the environment, um, here we just have a pressure of 4 pascals around the nanoparticles, we find a spectra that has a number of peaks, um, one of which corresponding to a little bit of hydrogen in the environment, that's at about 12 electron volts, one of which that corresponds to our silicon dioxide substrate on which we've placed the nanoparticles, and then we have another peak at 8 electron volts that corresponds to palladium. And I like to refer to this peak as uh, the incredible bulk plasmon resonance. Um, for those of you um, who have taken, say, like a, an optics class or an electronic materials class, um, you probably know that bulk plasmon resonances are kind of these like spherically symmetric breathing modes of electrons in the nanoparticle. You can almost think about this electron beam as being a point negative charge. So all of the conduction electrons in the palladium are going to pile up at the edges because they're repelled from the electron beam. And then when the electron beam has passed through, all those electrons kind of relax back into the center of the nanoparticle. So they're kind of breathing in and out. Um, that's that peak that occurs here at about 8 electron volts. When we introduce hydrogen, this bulk plasmon resonance shifts quite significantly by over 2 electron volts. And if you compare that with some of the other nano antenna based studies where you had just a slight change in the full width half max, this shift is um, something that gives us a very incredible signal to noise ratio with which to map out that phase transformation. So going from 4 pascals up to 100 pascals of hydrogen, you'll notice this hydrogen peak has jumped up pretty significantly. So we can use that as kind of a metric to know how much hydrogen we have in the environment, um, kind of a, a control to also double check just our gas valves. And then um, we also have on the shoulder of the hydrogen peak, the silicon dioxide peak from the substrate, and then the fully hydrated palladium um, hydride peak at just below 6 electron volts. So we can take these sorts of spectra um, at pressures. So basically, we're going to, um, over here, increase the pressure from 4 pascals up to 584 pascals, and then plot each of these spectra basically as a color map. Um, a horizontal slice on this map showing as a function of color the eels intensity and then we can decrease the pressure back down to 4 pascals. So you'll notice that um, originally the eel spectra shows a peak at just around 8 electron volts and then at one pressure there's a pretty abrupt jump um, over to about 6 electron volts where the particle is fully hydrated. It stays there as we're reducing the hydrogen pressure and then jumps back over to its um, alpha phase. So we've got the alpha phase and the beta phase. We can fit the peaks of these spectra, basically the map out isotherms. I apologize that you need to do a little bit of mental gymnastics. Right now these isotherms are flipped from how I introduced the talk. Um, so instead of having the hydrogen concentration plotted on the horizontal axis, now I'm showing energy. But just know that this corresponds to the alpha phase. Over here corresponds to the beta phase. And just like I pointed out with some of those ensemble measurements, these nanoparticles do exhibit hysteresis. So they tend to unload at lower pressures um, than they load. You'll also notice that each of these isotherms is actually quite sharp. So it's unlike some of the single particle measurements that were out there, and unlike the ensemble measurements that were out there. And also you'll notice that unlike bulk, there are no points that occur in this coexistence region. Um, so you'll remember in bulk we had a phase diagram where in here we had both alpha and beta coexisting. Um, but here when we're doing measurements in thermodynamic equilibrium, um, we don't see in these small nanoparticles coexistence. So we can do this study um, on a number of particles. Here we're varying the particle size from about 13 nanometers up to just about 30 nanometers. Um, we've now done these studies up to a few hundred nanometers. But um, I just want to give you kind of a, a flavor of what um, we've seen. First of all, we've noticed that all of these nanoparticles down to about 15 nanometers in size exhibit these very sharp transitions from the alpha phase to the beta phase. 
without there being really any coexistence. Um, another thing we've noticed, um, oh, I'll just point out that we can do um, Eels maps to confirm the existence of only a single phase in equilibrium. So when I collected these spectra, I had slightly defocused the beam so that it was sampling over a large area of the particle. If we want to take Eels maps, what we can do is focus the beam down to an even smaller probe size on the order of two nanometers and then scan it across the nanoparticle at different points. Um, so for example, if we take an Eels spectra focusing the beam down to this point here shown in green at zero pascals, we just have um, the alpha phase and over here in pink, um, we also just have the alpha phase. And then if we increase the hydrogen pressure, or just pure palladium in this case, if we increase the hydrogen pressure to 250 pascals um, at each of these points, you'll notice they both exist in the beta phase. And what we can do is basically not just look at two points, but look at hundreds of points within the nanoparticle to figure out what phase it's in. And at low hydrogen pressures, um, the system is entirely in its alpha phase. At high hydrogen pressures, the system is entirely in its beta phase. Um, so that was kind of one trend that we saw from the isotherms. Another is that if we looked at um, the loading pressures for each of these nanoparticles and compared it with the bulk loading of hydrogen in palladium, these um, transition regions always um, fell well below the bulk alpha to beta phase transition. So the bulk is shown as the white dotted line. You'll notice that the transition from the alpha to the beta phase in nanoparticles is always below that line. And another trend we saw is that if you plot the loading pressure as a function of particle size, the smaller particles tended to load at lower pressures. So it's much easier to get the particles that are smaller in the beta phase, or basically they transition to the beta phase at lower hydrogen pressures. And one way of rationalizing what's happening there is that when um, hydrogen gas catalytically splits into hydrogen atoms, at the surface, hydrogen can basically sit at those interstitial sites, kind of saturating the surface sites. And I told you that when we transition to the beta phase, there's a pretty big change in uh, volume, a 10% change in volume. So right at the surface, um, these fully saturated sites um, are kind of lattice expanded, and they're starting to pull on the core of the nanoparticle where hydrogen has not yet entered. So there's essentially tensile strain at the surface that's acting to kind of pull apart the nanoparticle, making it easier for hydrogen to get in there if the particle is smaller, because those surface layers have more an effect of an effect on those smaller nanoparticles. And um, shortly, I'll kind of show you some videos showing um, this process happening in real time to kind of uh, help confirm this hypothesis. OK, so I mentioned that we we're going to talk about a couple different shapes. Um, so how does nanoparticle shape affect thermodynamics? If we look at cubes, um, pretty much regardless of size, like I said, as long as they're above about 15 nanometers, we wind up with these very sharp transitions. Here, now I actually am plotting the concentration of beta on the horizontal axis. So cubes load abruptly and have sharp transitions. It also turns out prisms, regardless of size, has, have these very sharp transitions with no points in the coexistence region. But if we look at icosahedra, their isotherms are quite a bit more sloped, so almost more like those ensemble measurements right now. Um, and you'll also notice that once we're in the beta phase, we don't actually have um, as high a hydrogen concentration as we would have in these single crystalline nanoparticles. So first, let's take a look at the prisms. Let's do an Eels map and just confirm that we don't have phase coexistence. Um, here's the Eels map for a prism, and again, just like with the cubes, um, these prisms exist either only in the alpha phase or in the beta phase. In thermodynamic equilibrium, there isn't coexistence. But if we do that for icosahedra, um, here at low hydrogen pressures or no hydrogen, we essentially just have the alpha phase in the core. Um, but then when we move up to an intermediate hydrogen pressure, we have the alpha phase still existing in the core and the beta phase in the shell. So we have parts of the nanoparticle that aren't transforming um, to the beta phase. And it turns out that occurs even up to the highest hydrogen pressures that we can access. So our hypothesis is that if you consider what an icosahedra is composed of, it has 20 tetrahedra that don't quite fit together perfectly. So if you want to colloidally synthesize one of these nanoparticles, um, it turns out that all these icosahedra or tetrahedra packed together 
Um, but they leave kind of a strain gradient where the core is compressively strained and the outer part of the icosahedra is, is tensely strained. So the tetrahedra kind of need to pull apart at the surfaces to make one solid nanoparticle. So this compressive strain at the core makes it really hard for hydrogen to get in there, kind of regardless of how tensely strained the shell is, um, it's going to be very challenging for hydrogen to make its way into the core. Um, and that's why we think we're seeing coexistence of phases in the icosahedra. Um, also, I mentioned that there were these sloped isotherms for the icosahedral nanoparticles, and we wanted to investigate that a little bit further, so we turned to um, diffraction and dark field imaging. Here what we do is we take a diffraction pattern of our nanoparticle, and then we know that different spots in our diffraction pattern correspond to different crystallites in our nanoparticle. So what we can do is center our aperture over one of those diffraction spots, and then image which part of the nanoparticle that spot was coming from. So for example, spot number one, which is very close to spot number two, corresponds to this particular tetrahedra within the icosahedra that's diffracting to that point. And then what we can do is look at how individual tetrahedra or pairs of tetrahedra in the nanoparticle are transforming. So here are isotherms for, in this case, an individual tetrahedra. All the rest of these are pairs of tetrahedra. And you'll notice that the transition pressure from the alpha phase to the beta phase is occurring at different points um, within the nanoparticle. So this kind of helps explain why there's a little bit more of a sloped transition. Basically, different parts of the nanoparticle are transforming at different hydrogen pressures. And what we can do is take our diffraction data and our EELS data and combine that together to make um, a video kind of showing in three dimensions how these polycrystalline nanoparticles are transforming. So to kind of sum up this part, the core of the icosahedra is compressively strained preventing hydrogen storage there and basically reducing its energy storage capacity. And then grain boundaries are essentially decoupling all the crystallites within the nanoparticles, leading to mosaic loading, or a loading where different parts of the nanoparticle basically transform at different pressures. Okay, so all of that was in thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, I told you that we had this kind of hypothesis for why um, say smaller particles were um, loading at lower hydrogen pressures, so we wanted to know can we visualize non-equilibrium states. Um, and here's one video, um, ironically captured on an iPhone 6, um, where different uh, colored regions of the nanoparticle correspond to different phases. So again, we're in STEM mode, scanning transmission electron microscopy mode, and we're taking advantage of both the different um, electronic or eel scattering spectra plus the different um, diffraction patterns of the two phases. So white here corresponds to the beta phase, black corresponds to the alpha phase, and hopefully you saw kind of this triangular front move across the nanoparticle as it transitioned from this kind of stripey phase um, into the pure beta phase. So here we started off with the nanoparticle and kind of uh, a coexistence between alpha and beta. So we're fixed at a set hydrogen pressure. And then um, there's this diagonal phase front that kind of moves in from the corners um, and eventually takes over the entire particle when it becomes beta. So when we first captured this movie, we're like, oh, this is really cool. It shows that unlike those equilibrium measurements that I just presented, these non-equilibrium states show a clear coexistence of both phases. So in equilibrium, if we have a single crystalline nanoparticle, we don't have phase coexistence. But in order to get from one phase to another phase, we do need to have coexistence. And it turns out that coexistence is actually within the bulk of the nanoparticle. Here's another movie where we wanted to um, image the beginnings of ion intercalation. We didn't just want to capture the process kind of halfway through. Um, let me see if I can find the video to play this. So here again, white corresponds to beta, and hopefully you saw it kind of growing in from the corners of the cube. It kind of sprawled out to form these fingers, and then eventually forms a straight phase front that moves across the nanoparticle. Um, and then the uh, old phase gets pushed out, and then eventually the particle is fully transformed. I'll show you some snapshots of this video. Um, here you saw the mouse moving around because we were using kind of a separate technique to confirm which color was which phase. So here are snapshots of that video um, where right when the video starts or shortly thereafter, the beta phase, the new phase, kind of grows in from the corner. You can see it's also kind of wetting the surface of the nanocube. And then eventually this beta phase kind of all aligns itself to be along a 100 axis of this nanocube.
it kind of marches across the nanoparticle, moving from 272 seconds to 324 seconds. Here we've got the beta phase. The contrast has kind of switched. I can explain that in the Q&A session if you're interested to understand why. And then the beta phase grows across the nanoparticle, eventually pushing the alpha phase out through a corner of the cube. So <clears throat> in addition to looking at these STEM movies that kind of tell us how hydrogen is intercalating into the nanoparticle, in a nanocube basically entering through a corner and then reorienting itself from this diagonal interface into something that's straight across and then pushing the old phase out through a diagonal, we can also look at diffraction patterns. And I mentioned that this was a single crystalline nanocube. And when we um, introduce uh, hydrogen, that new phase has a different lattice constant um, than the alpha phase. Um, so we can rely on diffraction. So the innermost circle corresponds to beta, so basically has a smaller radius corresponding to a larger um, lattice constant. And then the outermost circle corresponds to the alpha phase. So right at the beginning of the transformation, we have coexistence of alpha and beta. Um, but in this diffraction pattern, you'll notice that the spots um, are very circular, um, corresponding to you know, essentially a, a very good crystal. There aren't many um, defects or imperfections in this crystal. But as the transformation occurs, um, you'll notice here, you'll notice that the um, diffraction spots get more diffuse um, and elliptical, meaning that basically imperfections are formed. Basically, uh, there are lattice rotations and potentially defects that are forming. And then at the end of the transformation, you'll notice that the diffraction spots kind of tighten up again, um, implying that the nanoparticle is trying to heal its imperfections. And if we go back and take a diffraction pattern of the pure beta phase nanoparticle, um, it's again back to a perfect single crystal. Um, so really importantly, these small single crystalline nanoparticles, even though they exhibit phase coexistence during the transformation, have the ability to heal themselves at the end of the transformation. OK, so what we've learned, um, basically single crystalline nanoparticles, regardless of shape, um, can maximize chemical energy storage. Basically, um, you can uh, get the particle to fully transform. And if you have smaller nanoparticles, you can get that to happen at smaller chemical potentials. So smaller particles store hydrogen more readily, i.e. at lower hydrogen pressures. Particles with defects or strains, such as the icosahedra, um, tend to have a reduced energy storage capacity. So essentially, we're not able to get any ions into the core of those compressively strained nanoparticles. <clears throat> and then also, we found that single crystalline nanoparticles um, can self-heal. So they have the ability to push out defects and lattice imperfections, um, leading to extended device life cycles. So that um, kind of helps to explain why these nanostructured electrodes and batteries give you more charge cycles, so 1,000 compared to, say, 100 from 20 or 30 years ago. Um, but this, I guess, uh, kinetic study also opens up the platform for kind of rationally designing next-generation next battery and um, uh, energy storage device uh, electrodes. So what's next? Um, for those of you who haven't seen the electron microscope on campus, it's um, basically one building over. Um, I think we can use this tool to help unravel other important nanomaterial transformations. For example, vanadium dioxide. It's a pretty common phase change material used in some electronic devices. Or bimetallic alloys, which are used quite frequently in different redox reactions, for example, for solar fuels. Um, or electrochromics, for example, for smart windows, like helping to design nanomaterials for um, various electrochromics. And then I'll also mention that um, what we've been working on lately is finding a way to couple light into and out of the microscope. I kind of started off this talk with um, a pitch for nanophotonics, and then I focused a lot on electron microscopy, but using kind of plasmon spectroscopy. Um, so being able to couple light into and out of the transmission electron microscope um, I think is really exciting because we'll have the ability to probe photochemical reactions um, in an environmental cell, whether that's a gaseous cell or a liquid cell. OK, so I know I only have um, a few more minutes, and I want to make sure I leave enough time for questions. But um, since I started off with nanophotonics, I do want there to be some light in my talk. Um, and uh, I just want to transition over to kind of quickly introduce to you a new um, upconversion scheme um, for utilizing subband gap photons in solar fuels and in um, solar cells. OK, so what is upconversion and, and what can it do um, to help us address renewable energy? If we take, say, just a single junction solar cell, 
um, we know that it can only absorb light above the band gap of the material. And that means that depending upon the band gap of the, of the solar cell, somewhere between about 20 and 50% of sun's energy can't be absorbed. It's basically lost to transmission. So the idea of an upconverting solar cell or solar fuel is that you would um, place the material behind the solar cell um, that can take the lower energy photons and combine them together into a higher energy photon that then can be absorbed by the cell material or by the cell above it, contributing to photocurrent. And unlike a multi-junction cell, this scheme doesn't require, um, say, lattice matching, so you don't need to grow the upconverter behind the solar cell. Um, you can just, say, colloidally synthesize an upconvert and then um, spray cast or spin coat these nanoparticles on the back of a cell. And then also importantly, the upconverter can be electrically um, insulated or isolated from the cell. So you don't have to worry about things like current matching. Like for example, in a traditional multi-junction cell, um, you're essentially limited by um, the worst cell in that stack. Here, the upconverter can only help to boost solar cell efficiencies. So if you look at calculations at how much um, an upconverter can improve a solar cell, um, with no upconverter, if you do a thermodynamic calculation, the peak efficiency is about 30% for a single junction cell. And if you add in an upconverter, um, that peak efficiency jumps up to about 44%. So a pretty significant improvement in cell efficiency. Of course, uh, most upconverters are not ideal. In fact, none of them are. Uh, most of them only absorb, say, over a narrow bandwidth of the solar spectrum. So obviously, as you can increase the bandwidth of where the upconverter is absorbing, you're going to get a larger boost in the solar cell efficiency. So ideally, we want um, a broad um, bandwidth absorber for upconverter and one that has a high efficiency. So let's take a look at some current upconverting materials. Um, I think two of the more promising ones um, are the bimolecular systems, which are quite good at upconverting um, visible light. Um, so, for example, they could find use in photoelectrochemical cells. Um, and then lanthanide-based systems are also quite common. They're quite good for uh, near-infrared to visible upconversion. So if you assume these materials are ideal, um, solar cell efficiencies can be improved by up to 2% for these bimolecular systems. These would, of course, be higher junction um, band gap solar cell or higher uh, band gap solar cells. With these lanthanide systems, solar cell efficiencies can be improved by up to 6%. Uh, so this is quite encouraging, especially for something like a silicon solar cell, where it's hard to make a tandem design. But these calculations, while they um, take into account the narrow absorption bandwidth of the uh, upconverter, they assume essentially unity quantum yields. And since it's a two-photon process, that means they're assuming that these um, upconverters are 50% efficient. And it turns out that these are generally nonlinear processes with typical quantum yields of less than 5%. So what my group has done is worked on kind of a new scheme for upconversion. Um, and it's kind of based on some insights from plasmonics where we have these metals that can act as nano antennas. And kind of historically what people have done is put metal nanoparticles near an upconverter to kind of more efficiently funnel light into the upconverter and then get the higher energy light out of the upconverter. But what we wanted to do is not just use plasmonics to enhance these sorts of light matter interactions, but enable new upconversion schemes. So here is kind of a layout of the upconversion scheme. We have a metal, a nanostructured metal, near a semiconducting quantum well. And when two photons come in, um, they excite electron hole pairs, basically from the Fermi level up to higher in the band diagram, and from kind of deeper in the metal band diagram up to the Fermi level. And then this hot electron and this hot hole can get injected into the semiconducting quantum well and basically get trapped there until they radiatively recombine to emit a photon that's of higher energy than either of the incident photons. So importantly, this is um, a linear upconversion scheme. I can um, talk you uh, through in the Q&A session why it's a linear scheme. Um, it works with incoherent illumination, so you don't need um, the electron and the hole to be temporally correlated to get them trapped in the semiconducting quantum well. And it's also spectrally tunable and more broadband, kind of based on how you nanostructure this metal. So let me just quickly talk you through some calculations. If you take, for example, a metallic nanoparticle on a semiconducting substrate, um, the absorption efficiency of this nanoparticle um, tends to peak at a given energy. That energy can be shifted around just based on the metallic material you're using and the size of the um, particle. 
Um, so here, this is something called the plasmon resonance, where the particle is absorbing most strongly. And what we need to know, first of all, is how efficiently this nanoparticle is um, able to uh, generate hot carriers, and then how efficiently it can uh, take those hot carriers and inject them into the quantum well. So the hot carrier population, if you illuminate this nanostructure, mm -hmm. tends to peak right on the plasmon resonance. So we get a large population of electrons and holes that can be ejected over um, the Schottky barrier. And then also if we calculate the hot carrier injection efficiency, um, that's something that kind of follows the electronic local density of states. Um, but depending upon the size of the nanoparticle, it can also be quite high on the order of 80%. So the um, upconversion efficiency is basically the product of how efficiently we can generate hot carriers and how efficiently we can inject carriers. Um, and for example, in um, this particular 5 nanometer nanocube, you'll notice that we get um, quantum efficiencies of upconversion that are over 20%. Um, so these small metallic nanoparticles provide generally for more efficient upconversion than existing material schemes. So we can get efficiencies of 25% rather than just less than 5% and generally more like 1%. And like I said, here I did all the calculations, um, or my postdoc guru did the calculations at visible frequencies, um, but we can also tune these materials to work in the near infrared. So can we demonstrate this technique? Um, the answer is yes. This was worked by my postdoc Guru Naik and an undergraduate student, Alex Welch. Um, as kind of a first proof of concept, they took um, small gold nanoparticles and placed them on gallium nitride indium gallium nitride quantum wells. When they illuminated the structure in the ultraviolet and detected the photoluminescence, they got a spectra that looked like this. Some of the oscillations come from Fabry Perot resonances in the nanostructure. Um, but you'll notice that it peaks at about 440 nanometers. And then we can shift our illumination wavelength to be kind of below the band gap of this quantum well structure. So here at 540 nanometers. And when the pillars were 100 nanometers across, we saw a clear upconversion that kind of paralleled the photoluminescence. We could also tune um, the upconversion spectral intensity based on the size of nanostructures, so 75 and 50 nanometers. And then if we had no gold, basically there's no upconversion. So I think this is a pretty cool scheme for taking a non-upconverting material and making it upconvert simply by adding a thin metallic nanostructure on so top. Can you wrap up in the energy? Pardon me? Can you wrap up in the energy? Yeah, yep, this is the last slide. Um, so we can look at the power dependence and also the uh, upconversion um, spectral dependence. And kind of the main uh, takeaway message from this slide is that um, the upconversion emitted power is linear, which is unlike most other upconverting systems where you have kind of this x squared power dependence. Um, so this linear transfer curve can only be explained by hot carrier injection and basically allows us to get more efficient upconversion with very low illumination intensities or illumination powers. So all of these preliminary results were obtained with a laser. Our ongoing work is um, now demonstrating hot carrier upconversion with incoherent sources and then moving on to show um, infrared to visible up conversion. Okay, so I promised that was my last slide. Um, kind of summaries. Um, first of all, hopefully I've shown you that plasmonic methods um, from uh, you know, various like field enhancements and metasurfaces to hot carriers um, can help enable uh, next generation clean energy technologies. My particular work has focused on how plasmonic methods um, can allow us to better visualize some of these energy storage um, devices. And what we found in looking at a relatively simple and straightforward system that has many parallels to lithium ion batteries is that single crystalline nanoparticles tend to exhibit this pixel switching where they're either in one phase or another, but they don't coexist in equilibrium. Whereas these polycrystals exhibit kind of mosaic loading. Um, where like parts of the nanoparticle don't transform to the new phase. And also I've shown you that these single crystalline nanoparticles can self-heal. And then in the last couple of minutes, I showed you a new scheme for renewable energy conversion that can use more of the solar spectrum. Um, it's based on hot carriers being injected from a metal into a semiconductor that enables um, tunable, linear, and efficient sub-band gap frequency conversion. So with that, I'd like to thank um, our funders um, and also all of my group members who made this work possible. Um, many of them are pointed out here. Um, Tarun graduated earlier this year. He's now a postdoc at the University of Maryland. He helped pioneer a lot of the in-situ electron microscopy work, um, along with Andrea Baldi. He's now a professor at the FOM Institute Differ. Um, and then I'll also point out 
um, Guru Naik, um, who helped enable uh, much of the uh, hot carrier work. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much for your attention. Wow, that was a lot. Uh, any quick questions from the audience? We just have a few minutes here. Seeing none, I'll ask one. Uh, somebody like me can take the results almost immediately from your um, up conversion work and put it into like an economic model and into markets. So I can see that is a big deal. Mm -hmm. All those percentages are worth gold. Um, I can't quite do that for the battery, the storage one. I can imagine that the percentages are big enough that it's going to help a lot. Have you uh, done that, or do you have anybody you work with who's done that, working on a startup? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we haven't done any of the uh, economic modeling, but um, we're definitely interested in collaborating with people who can kind of figure out like what would be the cost associated in taking, say, uh, you know, a conventional electrode material and then uh, developing syntheses to nanostructure it, say, into a single crystalline nanocube or a single crystalline, you know, say, rod, where you have kind of this long um, aspect ratio to enable like a larger surface area to volume ratio. So kind of figure out that cost and then say, yep, like, is it worth it to pursue these syntheses and put these materials into electrodes? Yeah, then Sally Steam actually could scale up to in between my level, which is really macro, into kind of a marketable device. So, I can speak so, so on the up, uh, up conversion, that, that's really hard to see. Uh, so what is kind of the pathway to make devices to do that? And then how do you see those competing with some of the other schemes like tandem perovskites or perovskites with silica and then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I guess I'll start with the second question first, which is um, how do we see this upconversion scheme competing with you know, other schemes like the tandem perovskite? So I mentioned that upconversion is especially promising for, say, silicon solar cells, where it's a little bit more challenging to make a multi-junction cell. Um, there are people here on campus who have done some really nice work with kind of tandem perovskite silicon architectures. Um, I would probably refer you to them um, to kind of discuss the most up-to-date um, research there, but. Uh, my impression is that the perovskites still have some challenges with stability, and they're working on new encapsulation techniques. Um, but I would say that this scheme, um, first of all, doesn't have that problem with stability. Um, and secondly, I think even if um, those cells work really well, that's actually great because we can easily put an up converter behind the cell and still get an added boost over um, some so of the record cells that have been made here. So it's quite complementary to that scheme. In terms of uh, marketing this, um, right now, uh, we had just kind of a proof of concept of, say, gold nanoparticles on um, a gallium nitride, indium gallium nitride quantum well structure. I don't think, or I know for sure, that's not going to be the sort of structure you want to grow behind your solar cell. The economics of that just aren't going to scale. Um, but I have one student who's working on um, colloidally synthesizing these nanostructures, so making um, various air-stable quantum dots that can be decorated with metallic nanoparticles, so that way you could just um, paint these up-converting materials behind the cell. Great, last word over here. Yes, how far away is commercial fabrication? Commercial fabrication. Now, what are they doing versus what, what you're doing? Um, in the upconversion scheme or in, oh, okay. Um, so uh, commercially, there are of course companies that make uh, upconverting materials um, either by uh, you know, ion acceleration or by colloidal syntheses. Um, there are no companies that I know of that are adding up, converter, uh, up converters behind the cell. And that's simply because the efficiency is not there yet. Like I mentioned, most of the conventional up converting schemes um, have efficiencies that are too low to yield a significant boost in cell efficiencies. Like I think the maximum boost people have seen uh, is on the order of 0.01%, uh, um, but that was under concentrated sunlight. Um, so hopefully this scheme um, that you promises higher efficiencies could be something that, that makes it a scalable technology. Great. We're kind of out of time. So Jen, thanks for sharing just a little bit of your magic with us today. Yeah, thanks. Yeah.